Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to start my intervention by thanking the very, for the very generous invitation, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Boroy, Rector of the Nicolai Titovesco University, for the chance to be here. Um, it's an honor to speak in this forum, which has been going on. Uh, I understand it's already in its eighth edition. And of course, also to uh, the head manager of the conference, uh, Kamu Karayman, for all her hard work in making this event a success. <coughs> uh, Excellency Rector, uh, Kamu Karayman, ladies and gentlemen, um, my topic today is European Union Diplomacy. I'll try to put my points across as elegantly and as clearly as uh, my colleague, uh, Manuel de Luna, um, by starting making a few uh, general observations. I know we have in the room both legal scholars, economists, uh, politologists, etc. So I will try to uh, maybe unite some points from different fields. Um, some basic characteristics when we analyze European Union diplomacy and its organization is, um, of course, the inescapable uh, nature of the European Union as not quite a federal state, but not quite an international organization either. This means that there's no agreement on what the European Union is as a subject of international relations, as a subject of international law, and it can indeed be described as something that is in between and at the same time both the process and the subject and this is something I will come back to. EU diplomacy uh, in my point of view is an extremely complex case um, depending on how we define EU diplomacy some see it as simply a matter of what official EU representatives do. I think this is um, of course, a limitation of our analysis, uh, but at the same time, we lose some of the more interesting aspects, I think, of the general phenomenon of sovereign states integrating and trying to establish a common representation towards the third states. I will now try to outline three basic scenarios for how the European Union acts. Um, these are very simplistic, and you will have to excuse me also the visual design, which is not my great strength. Anyway, I think it's useful to illustrate um, three um, scenarios. <clears throat> the first of all is where we have the European Union substituting the member states when it acts in the world. In this case, um, the question is relatively simple, because we have a transfer of competences to the European Union, which then represents the member states, but a single subject acting. And of course, this almost never happens. We're simply not at this stage of European integration. <coughs> Another option is um, when there's no agreement within the European Union, and therefore uh, there's no common EU position to represent by European Union diplomats. In this case, we have all the different member states, all 28, with their individual positions, maybe coordinated, maybe not, depending on the issue. Um, this depends again, member state interests in different areas. Um, we have seen, for example, um, when push comes to show, such as during the conflict over the intervention in Iraq led by the United States, we had a common EU position, but um, when the United States began insisting uh, two sides, uh, we saw that there was simply no political cohesion in the European Union to continue with and defend a common position. Um, this, almost, this is also a very rare case that we have no EU position at all. What is most common is that we have a coexistence of these two levels of diplomatic representation. In this case, what is the task of the newly established internal action service? Of course, to avoid that the EU position becomes a lowest common denominator, to try and find common ground among the member states, to have a strong European position, and that the individual diplomatic activities of each member state is at least coordinated and compatible with the common EU position. In this case, we are talking about a problem basically of vertical coherence within the European Union, meaning between the level of the member states 
and the activities of the European Union. And this is important to keep in mind this dimension because when we talk about um, the organization of the European Union, this backdrop of its inevitable coexistence with independent member state diplomacy um, is really a determining factor. And I think it's also fair to say that this dimension of the vertical relationship is something that has really been affected by the establishment of the European External Action Service. <clears throat> if we do a small flashback in time, um, I have tried to uh, visualize how the European Union, as a diplomatic actor, was organized before the effects uh, of the Lisbon Treaty, mainly in the form of the establishment of the External Action Service. Here you will see we are only focused on the European Union level. We have already excluded the complicating dimension of the coexistence with the member states. This is basically how the pillar structure translates into uh, the institutional expression of European Union diplomacy. On one hand, in green, we have uh, the Commission pillar, the uh, Community pillar, where uh, a Special Director General, the RELEX, is supposed to coordinate the external activities. But in a totally separate hierarchy, we have the CFSP, the former uh, second pillar, which end uh, with the high representative or the rotating presidency of the council as its maximum uh, representation. This, of course, generates a series of problems as well to have different policy areas in different uh, hierarchies within the European Union. In this case, we can talk about uh, the challenge of the horizontal coherence between different policy areas and between different actors involved in the execution of EU foreign policy. This, of course, um, we can talk about coherence, both at the political level, at the level of decision-making in Brussels, where there needs to be coherence in form of content, for instance, between the development policy objectives of the European Union and the defense of human rights, for instance, on one part, and then geopolitical concerns of the stability of neighboring countries in uh, the CFSP area. This is where we've seen it clash, for example, in the run-up to the Arab Spring, uh, where the EU was not really clear and trying to achieve two different things at the same time. <coughs> this led um, to a very widespread perception of there being some fundamental flaws in the institutional design of EU diplomacy. I've tried to sum it up in, in some different uh, points here. The vertical coherence. When the European Union is not, uh, does not have the competences to represent the member states in all policy areas, there is necess necessarily the issue of the coherence between member state activities and what the European Union does. <clears throat> and I think experience shows that institutional innovation cannot really help much here. Um, we still have uh, consensus decision making in CFSP areas, but interestingly enough, instead of the sort of top-down institutional design intended to improve coordination, what we actually see on the ground in third states, that bottom-up coordination reflex among member states, where the ambassadors get together, try to work out some common positions, even in the absence of instructions from their home foreign ministries. And I think this shows um, a common European spirit that goes beyond legal obligations, but actually shows um, a form of um, you know, bottom-up kind of leadership in this process. The horizontal coherence between the different policy areas I've already talked about, um, not only political, uh, political coherence, but of course how this is expressed in the representation of these policy areas by different actors, by the Commission, by uh, the High Representative, and by uh, the rotating presidency of the Council. However, due to the absence of a common EU representation, we also had some protocol issues, which is not really uh, a question of EU foreign policy, but of its diplomatic constitution in and by itself. For instance, um, in the process of the dissolution of the Yugoslavia, the European Union, since this is a CFSP policy area, we have a rotating presidency at this point uh, under the leadership of Luxembourg. And we have the Troika formulation that also included the Netherlands and Portugal. 
this is uh, the EU, how it choose to represent itself internationally, with never the, which nevertheless clash in many instances with the expectations of third states. Why? It's simply a lack of respect to send such low-level representatives to negotiate important policy issue areas. In this case, what do third states do? They ignore the Troika and talk directly to the German representative, the French representative, the British representative, etc., etc. There's simply lack of political weight. <clears throat> and of course, we have an extremely complex situation. If you imagine the situation of a diplomat from a third state that wants to talk to the European Union, you need to be mm, more or less an expert on EU law to understand who to talk to about which area. And what happens if there's sort of an issue area that strides the different pillars in the European Union, who actually has the competence to talk on behalf of the European Union. This generated both a lack of visibility and a lack of political influence. This is evident both among academic analysis but also in the policy papers of both the Council and, and the European Commission. There's a general perception that this happens. So, the point was, with all these problems due to the institutional design, the European Union had developed far beyond a cooperation organization. What can we do to solve this? In this case, the answer of the European Union was basically this one. <clears throat> Lady Ashton has been criticized a lot for her function as um, the high representative, the head diplomat of the European Union. There's been so many jokes of the style, well, if she's the solution, I really didn't understand the problem, Speaking, people making jokes on her behalf. This is not my point here. I'm actually serious when I talk about uh, Lady Ashton as a solution. Not because of her personal skills, which is a different debate, but because of the post that she occupies, which is absolutely vital to coordinate the EU diplomacy. <clears throat> Why? We see this here. Um, we have a reorganization in, of the EU diplomacy where basically um, the different lines all end uh, with the Vice President of the European Commission and High Representative. So we have a fusion of the former different uh, hierarchies, organizational hierarchies, where both now uh, second pillar issue areas and the CFSP, which is now reorganized into the central bureaucracy of the European External Action Service, but also the different Commission delegations with foreign policy activities. It all ends with the same person and her cabinet. And this, of course, to improve horizontal coherence among different policy areas and uh, also uh, make sure that the activities of each one complement each other and just do not contradict. Well, this is absolutely vital. <clears throat> also, um, Whereas this overcomes many problems with respect to the horizontal coherence of EU diplomacy, what about the vertical coherence? Where are the member states in all this? And I think probably in a long-term perspective, this is even more interesting. Why? Because the External Action Service consists of uh, EU diplomats coming from the Council, coming from the Commission, but also seconded officials from the National Foreign Ministries. This means that we have uh, more or less 6,000 persons working together, coming from very different cultural backgrounds, from different organizational backgrounds, from different states, and from the EU bureaucracies. Um, sociological theories predict that this will lead to a process of socialization, hopefully people coming to share, to a great extent, common problem perceptions, a worldview, maybe even sort of a common identity, as representative of the EU, which in the long run should also, when these second diplomats come back to the foreign ministries and others go, etc., etc., help to improve the vertical coherence, meaning that the foreign ministry should increasingly come to think of the European dimension to each foreign policy issue area, not only think in bilateral terms. But this, of course, remains to be seen. This is not a matter of months or maybe even years, but more likely of years and decades. So this is about the organization, but what happens on the ground in the third states? I think the major revolution that the External Action Service represents is 
that we now have an EU delegation to third states and international organizations representing the EU across all policy areas. The rotating presidency, the diplomatic representation of the member state holding the presidency uh, simply disappears. So for third states, this is an immense reduction of complexity and should also help coordinate EU activities on the ground. I'm not saying that every problem of horizontal coherence has been solved, but uh, complexity has been reduced, and I think also the institutional setting for improved coordination is uh, a lot better, if not as good as it can be. But again, remembering that member states still have their national embassies, and there's a lot that simply does not make sense to coordinate within the EU. For example, if a Spanish ambassador to Argentina uh, wants to do some kind of event of cultural exchange with Argentina, two countries that share a historical legacy, shares a language, shares um, a culture to some extent. There's simply no point in coordinating this with the Finnish or the Bulgarian ambassador because mm, it doesn't have anything to do with them. So we have this coexistence inevitably, but when we talk about EU policy, at least we have only one representation. In this case, um, <clears throat> the, the External Action Service greatly changes the game and I think um, improves coherence uh, quite much. This is, of course, uh, permitted by the fact that bilateral relations are basically based on reciprocity and on the consent of the states, meaning there's no problem for the European Union representations to have all the rights and privileges of the uh, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, etc., etc. If we talk about the European Union in international organization, the situation is much more complex. Why? Because we have a clash between what the EU is internally, according to EU law, and what international law and the law, the internal law, the illegal constitution of other international organizations um, say. So in this case we have in many times a clash. Imagine, even in issue areas where the EU has competences to represent both EU and the member states, it's not always so that uh, the treaty on which the international organization is based allows the EU to be a member, to even speak, to even be present in the meetings. So in this case, what can the External Action Service do? Sort of wait in the corridor while the member state representatives try to function within this organization as a unit. The most extreme case is um, the International Monetary Fund, where the EU member states are divided into different groups within the International Monetary Fund that vote together. Meaning that even if all the member states were to agree, it's simply materially impossible to, to present a common EU position due to the internal constitution of the International Monetary Fund. But also, at the other end, we have international organizations where the EU is a member, such as the World Trade Organization, but alongside the EU member states. And here there's still a lot of confusion. Why? Issue areas cover um, areas where um, the External Action Service has competence to represent the EU, but other issue areas remain within member state competence. So in this case, there's still a role for the rotating presidency because the EU cannot um, speak in all policy areas. So we have different kinds of formulations where an EU representative speaks on behalf of the EU, this is one option, can speak on behalf of the EU and the member states, or on behalf of the member states only. And this creates a lot of confusion on the part of third states. Who's actually speaking on behalf of whom? And what happens after a person stands up and claims to speak on behalf of the European Union? Two member state representatives also stand up and speak on behalf of their state. What is then the case? Who's actually mm, bound by what the EU representative has said? As long as the positions are compatible, there's no problem, but if they are not, and this creates uncertainty and uh, confusion. This also means that what is uh, absolutely vital is the coordination among member states' representatives. In this case, we have more than 1,300 
coordination meetings of EU member states every year in New York, um, mainly to do with the representation in the UN system. So a general impression is that the European Union remains very fragmented as a diplomatic actor when we talk about multilateral relations, and in any case depends on the willingness, the flexibility on all member states, and on informal arrangements for trying to hammer out common positions that can be defended via different EU representatives. So, in this case we can say that on one hand the European Union uh, External Action Service is an institutional revolution, but mainly in Brussels and with respect to bilateral relations. Uh, it rationalizes um, the representation but I think it, we still to see the impact it could have in international organizations. Again, stemming from the legal nature of the European Union as a subject. Um, another point is, in this case, we should not simply consider the EU um, External Action Service as a foreign service, as if it were a member state. This inevitably leads to de deception, uh, to disappointment, etc. Why? Because mm, the EU is a bigger state, so we cannot place the same demands on the external action service as we would on a national diplomatic service in terms of coherence and in terms of political impact. Uh, I think I have uh, time to go to comment also briefly some wider perspectives. Um, one thing is, we can study the organization of the European Union, how bureaucracies are transformed. We can study the legal consequences, we can study economic aspects uh, of all of this, but I think also when we join different perspectives, uh, what comes out is actually some more general questions that are very interesting. First of all, the European Union as a unique international actor, it's one of its kind. What is it that we see? We see that um, the European Union, to actually function diplomatically, it needs to adapt to the existing structures in the international system. This is what I mean by isomorphic pressure. There's this constant pressure upon the EU to organizationally resemble a state for it to be able to participate, particularly in the international organization. This is not about content, it's only about form. And I think also it's fair to interpret the External Action Service as the attempt by the European Union to uh, resemble a state and the state structures to a greater degree. More abstract, um, we also have the issue of who is actually represented by this External Action Service. Diplomats always talk about the we but very rarely specifying who that we actually includes. In the case of a state diplomat, this is not very controversial. Uh, obviously, that person represents the state, represents the nation, etc. In the case of the European Union, this is not necessarily very clear. Do we feel represented as European citizens by the acts of the External Action Service? Do we feel that this is us acting when Catherine Ashton goes to a negotiation in Geneva? Or do we feel that this is another actor foreign to us and to our national diplomatic systems? We are basically paying for it and we are the citizens that this is supposed to represent. So I think this should lead us all to some wider reflections of, about what we actually want with this external action service, which are the interests that this should actually represent. Which of course feed into a, a greater debate also about the democratic accountability and legitimacy of this external action service. And the point is not here to be critical and criticize the, the legitimacy of this external action service. But I think uh, the European Union as a polity, particularly with the external action service, has developed to a degree where we can say that output legitimacy is no longer enough for us. That the EU uh, achieves results internationally through its diplomats, is that really enough? Or do we also want some kind of process legitimacy? That 
there's actually a clear line of delegation of authority from the individual citizen to the diplomat representing the citizen. In the EU case, mm, there are very many levels, because through parliamentary elections, of which a state government arises, of which a position in um, the council of 28 member states, a common position is hammered out, after which this is delegated to an EU diplomat to represent. I think this is very indirect, and I think it's mm, inevitable that we need to start also considering uh, different forms of democratic accountability in respect of the European External Action Service. <clears throat> Finally, the final point um, I want to make is um, when I started studying European Union diplomacy um, quite a few years ago, um, what we actually found in the discourses of, uh, of the EU and which still is prevalent is that basically of being something else than the Westphalian state. That the European Union in and by itself is a structural solution to the problems of the coexistence of sovereign states. The European Union, the process of integration, is what has made possible to overcome the negative dynamics among European states and ensure peace on the European continent for the first time and also um, unprecedented levels of economic prosperity. This is all very fine. But what this, what this meant was also that the European Union projected itself to the world as a different kind of thing than just another entity defending its narrow interests in sort of a competitive logic with other actors. Nevertheless, Recently, and with the External Action Service as being uh, symptomatic of this development, we are increasingly seeing calls for the European Union to behave in a more traditional manner, to defend the interests in geopolitical and economic terms of the European Union. I think this is a major paradigmatic shift. Um, it's not controversial uh, in official EU communication. This is more or less accepted, but um, from a theoretical point of view, we can say if the European Union, the success of the European Union in terms of managing and ensuring peace among sovereign states was based on not creating dynamics of an us and a them, but of a more general us, including a larger we, and not creating these uh, competitive logics among states, the European Union is actually not truthfully, truthful to its own origins, acting like this in the international system, but trying to sort of mm, do a return to the past, of which European Union identity is based on, on a break. The European Union identity as an actor is based with this break with the past and a new era of integration and the common we. And now, actually, I think um, that this is very noteworthy that we see a paradigmatic shift to actually incorporate this other into the European we and on a larger scale actually recreating some of the competitive logics that the European Union integration process in itself serves to overcome. So I think in this larger perspective, I think um, we as citizens also should be careful that what we do is not to equip the European Union with an external action service that maybe allow us to win a few battles in the short term, in terms of geopolitical interest and economic interest in the very short term, but then losing the war in the long term and on a global scale by creating competitive logics uh, instead of more cooperative logics in the, greater, uh, in the greater world. And with this, I want to say uh, thank you for your attention. Multimask. I would like to thank uh, Professor Stephen Bay Rasmussen for his presentation.